Hi, it's Dre Griggs with Obsidian Wisdom. Today we discuss bad financial habits that could derail your retirement. Today I'll walk you through bad financial habits that could derail your retirement dreams and what to do about them. First on our list is the belief that spending equals happiness. So when it comes to overspending, I believe most of us know what we should be doing. We know that there are three relationships that you can have with money. You either spend more than what you have, all that you have, or less than what you have. Those are the only three choices that any of us can have. And for us to be able to stop working, we have to spend less than what we have now. The idea is I need to purchase my freedom. Ideally, when we're halfway towards retirement, half of our monthly income is being generated from our investments. We have purchased half of our time back. And then when you reach your retirement, ideally, we have 100% of our income being generated from our investment. We no longer have to spend our time to receive a little bit of money. Now, I know this firsthand. I remember when I retired from corporate America to start working and open my own company. And within a few months, I realized that the monthly bills were still coming in and my monthly income was not. And I wasn't 100% sure how to generate the income that I needed without actively working. And so for most of us, it comes to making a couple decisions early on. First and foremost, if you're spending more than what you have or all that you have, then you don't have any money that you can invest towards your financial freedom. And if you cannot invest any money towards your financial freedom, then we'll always have to be working for our income. Now, what most people do is we have this misunderstanding that if I'm working in a job I don't like, or there's something in my life that doesn't quite fulfill me, that ultimately means that I should reward myself for my suffering. And when we talk about rewarding ourselves, what are we going to do? Most of the time, we're going to spend the money on something. But the interesting thing is, is we're always recalibrating what is making us happy. The new job at one point in our life was the job that we prayed that we would get. And then there's the new car at one point in our life that we always dreamed of getting. And whatever it is that gives us that short-term happiness, that little moment, the little burst of happiness, well, that goes away when we recalculate our lifestyle. And the way I often tell people is it's okay to want more. It's okay to realize that something wasn't everything you thought it would end up being. It is okay to adjust our goals along the way. The way I would describe it is you want to be content, but not complacent. It's okay to appreciate everything that you have in your life and to feel blessed about it, but it's also okay to want something more in life. The mistake that most of us make is we're going to spend more than what we have, or maybe we'll even quit that job a little early, or we'll make these different decisions that have long-term financial consequences. And the reality is that burst of happiness that we achieve by making that short-term decision, it goes away relatively quickly. The majority of us are going to be able to create our happiness by how we spend our time. We spend our time on things that bring us pleasure and things that bring us purpose. And the less control you have over your time, the less happy I believe you'll end up being, which means it's even more likely that you'll be overspending trying to find this happiness which is putting us deeper in the hole. And that's why the majority of Americans who are going to retire today are going to retire broke. It's also why the majority of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. It's even why six-figure households, that half of them live paycheck to paycheck. Because we're spending our money trying to create this feeling, and it only lasts for a short amount of time. And it's almost like we're addicted to spending in many ways, where we keep spending trying to get that high that we had the first time, and it's just not really working. This idea of spending more or all that we have is always going to catch up to us in the end. We have to spend less than what we have and be able to purchase all of our freedom because believe you me, once you've purchased all of your freedom and you have control of your time and you're able to start spending your time doing things that bring you pleasure and purpose, I feel that you will find yourself as happy as you've ever been. Number two on our list is procrastinating on savings where we feel that the immediate pressure that we're dealing with requires our immediate attention. And when it comes to our future goals and purchasing our freedom, we're really sitting there saying, well, that is a great idea. That is a wonderful notion. But the truth is I have problems right now. I have to deal with the fires that are burning right now. If you've ever worked in corporate America, then you're well aware that every single day that you go into the office, there is a fire burning that day. And no matter what you do that day, there will be a new fire burning tomorrow. And that is kind of an idea that's very similar to what our normal life is. There's always going to be challenges. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be a better opportunity in the future. Because we think of the future as this perfect world, and then we think of our present as the imperfect world. 
And it makes it sometimes where we'll say, yeah, that's what I'll do when my kids graduate because I'll have more income. But that may or may not be the case. There may be new issues in the future. And we'll talk about how our health can impact our overall retirement later on in this video. We could talk about whether we have marriages and divorces or additional kids or job layoffs, or we just make a complete change overall. There's so much that can happen in the future. But if we're always saying, I need things to be perfect for me to be able to save more money, well, you and I know that that's unlikely to happen. If our goal is to be able to fund our retirement, then that requires us to make a few changes. In saving your money, where we're allocating our money towards an emergency fund, we're allocating our money towards some investments, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and we're allocating our money towards some of our debt, which we'll also talk about a little bit later, this all starts with you spending less than what you have. And a lot of the times we feel the pressure of the moment. Every single day, the burden of these different decisions are laying on top of us. But the reality is there was nothing that we did today that really created the life that we have now. We made decisions two years ago, three years ago, that have created the life that we have now, which means that if we want something better two years from now, then we have to make decisions today that creates that lifestyle two years from now. If we continually are saying, well, in the future, it'll be better, but we keep making the same decisions today, how can the future be better? And so when it comes to our bad financial habits, it's this idea that they're not linked together, that the decisions I'm making today don't impact my future, that my future is going to be better because that's just what happens. And I will at that time make different decisions. Whereas the idea that I'll go to the gym when I'm in better shape, because I don't want to embarrass myself at the gym. Well, we put the cart before the horse. We have to go to the gym to get our body in better shape. And so sometimes we have to make the decisions today that will create the lifestyle that we want in the future. And so we don't want to procrastinate on our saving. We want to get in the habit of saving money so that we also don't have to worry about making really rough and tough financial decisions in the future because we've already given ourselves a little bit more flexibility because of the decisions that we made today that will benefit us two years from now. That leads pretty nicely into number three on our list, which is ignoring debt. We just talked about the idea that the decisions that I made several years ago impact me today. Our debt and credit cards in particular are a great sign of that. We could have made a less than stellar financial decision two or three years ago, and we're still paying on that decision. We sometimes could have made a less than stellar financial decision five to six years ago, and we're still making payments on that decision. There is this reality that when we get in debt, our money is then tied up, where ideally we're able to invest 15 to 30% of our money, ideally somewhere around that middle where we can invest 20% of our money, where one fifth of our check goes towards our retirement and our future, where all the money we make on Monday goes towards our future. And then the money that we make on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we can keep that to fund our current lifestyle. Well, for a lot of us, we have debt that we have to pay off. And because our money isn't able to work in the most efficient manner, we're always putting money towards the debt and our debt is going down very slowly. Well, we're allocating hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars on a regular basis, every single month or every single year. And the balance is just not going down that much. And there's two things that are happening. When I have an unexpected expense, let's say my car needs a new AC or something happens inside of my house. If I don't have anything saved, I'm then going to have to use a card again. And if I use the card again, well, I'm now resetting my credit card debt where I was able to make consistent payments of $100, $200, $500 every single month, and I'm paying down my credit card debt. And then the moment something happens and I have to use a credit card because I don't have enough saved to just handle it, it then resets. It's like we literally lose a year or two based off of one unexpected expense which is why the most efficient manner for us to allocate our money for our retirement requires us to really get our debt under control. If we're spending 20% of our salary on our debt past things that we bought, then that means we're mortgaging our future. Now we can't do what the United States government does, right? You know that we're about $36 trillion in debt currently. We've almost added $2 trillion to the deficit this year alone. Now the government's gonna say, well, I have a bill I need to pay. I'm just gonna walk into my money printing garage. I'm gonna push some buttons and I'm gonna print out some money. 
like an ATM machine that you just automatically get the money. You never have to deposit it in the ATM machine. That's how the government treats printing money. So they just continue printing money, but the debt and the deficit keep going up to where even the government, where they're talking about 70, 80% of the revenue that the government is generating goes toward just paying the interest on the debt. You and I know that that is unsustainable. Well, for many of us, we're not $36 trillion in debt, but the idea is the same, where if a large percentage of my money is going towards just paying the interest on my debt, I can't put any money towards my future. And it leaves me in this really difficult situation where I don't have enough money to put towards my savings and the emergency fund and unexpected expenses, and then I have to continually use that credit card to make ends meet because I have so much of my money tied on the debt. And so as a result, we could end up losing not five years, but we're talking 10, 15 years of our retirement investment because the way our debt is, which is why for most people, getting out of debt should be pretty high on the list that we want to break the habit of going in debt. And that bad financial decision by itself is going to ruin most people's retirement. When you look at the numbers, and I think the last time I saw it, it said we had over a trillion dollars in credit card debt alone. We're talking about just the average United States consumer. And that is a really large number. These are some things that we track when we're trying to figure out, are we going to go into recession? How healthy is the economy? And that means that the majority of the middle class is using their credit cards to fund their lifestyle, which means that as we just mentioned in the beginning, they're spending more than what they have, which is unsustainable when it comes to purchasing our freedom and being able to retire on our own terms and live our life as we've always dreamed it to be. There are really two schools of thought when it comes to getting rid of your debt. First and foremost, a lot of people like the idea of paying my high interest debt first, so then my money is working more efficiently where I'm not being charged as much interest on my lower debt. The other one is I want to feel the win. I want to be motivated to keep paying off my debt. And in that one, you'd pay from your smallest balance to your largest balance to where you allocate that same percentage of money, no matter what the balance is on the card, where if you allocate $2,000 a month towards your debt, and then that may have been over 20 cards, and then you have one card left, you don't now change how much you allocate. You still allocate the same $2,000 per month. It's just now going towards one less credit card. The second consideration that we normally have when it comes to paying off debt is we normally look at whether it's a simple interest or compounding interest. Credit card with compounding interest, it means the interest is calculated on the debt every single day. And as a result, it makes it really hard to get out of debt. Where the same benefit of compounding interest in the stock market works for us, it works against us when it comes to revolving debt. So most of the time we want to pay off our credit cards first and then allow our simple interest. That's things like your mortgage and your car payment. It's already set. There is a set amount that you pay each month. And there's a set amount that goes towards principal and a set amount that goes towards interest. And then if you want to pay extra, it goes straight on to principal. That is a much easier debt to pay off. And that's why some people like to consolidate their debt. That really is a case by case basis. I've seen it work for some people. I've seen it not work for others. It really starts with our mindset and the beliefs that we have to even get to a point to decide which strategy will work the best for you. Number four on our list is not investing enough. It is one thing to be living below your means. It's another thing to be saving your money. It's something else altogether to be able to get out of debt. But if we don't invest our money towards our freedom where our money is working for us, then we will always be working for it. And you guys know that I'm big on allocating our investments in a way that's aligned with what we see work for self-made millionaires. And the numbers say that 65% of self-made millionaires have at least three streams of income. And the IRS recognizes seven streams, so we just have to decide which three streams make the most sense for us. And those are normally going to be found in three asset classes. You either invest in real estate, the stock market, or a business. And if you invest in one of these three asset classes, you will be set up to be able to purchase your freedom much quicker than someone who's just saving their salary. We have to have our money working for us. So these are the places where it makes the most sense to put our money to work. The government is more favorable because they want us to give people housing and they want us to give people jobs. So if you're invested in assets that provide those two benefits, the government is very generous in the way it generally taxes us because we're helping the government get what it wants. It wants everyone to have a job, and it wants everyone to have a house to live in. So that is why those are normally the three best asset classes. Now, I personally enjoy investing in the stock market because you have access to all seven streams of income 
inside of the stock market. I can invest in REITs if I want to invest in real estate. I can obviously buy stocks in a variety of small businesses and be a silent business partner, and I can invest in the profits of those businesses. I can choose businesses that have patents and royalties so I can receive that stream of income. I can invest in debt from the government or other corporations so I can have interest income, and I can invest in some stocks that give out dividend income as well. So you can see that we have access to so many streams of income inside of the stock market, and that is why the numbers show that 89% of the stock market is currently owned by the top 10% of wealth in the United States. And that is also why the bottom 50% of wealth in the United States owns less than 1% of the stock market. It, the numbers are very clear in the sense that if you want to grow your money, if you want to purchase your freedom, if you want to make sure that you outpace inflation so that you don't have to worry about running out of money, you must invest in assets that give you the appropriate return. If inflation averages 3% and you've seen it, inflation just like two years ago was at a 40 year high. So it sometimes goes even higher then we normally should be invested in assets that perform well in the times of inflation, which naturally lends itself to us investing in businesses that are raising their prices and investing in real estate that is appreciating because of the inflation. These assets allow us to take advantage of inflation where it's not something that we have to be afraid of, but it's something that we can benefit from. And if we're uncomfortable investing our money in these different asset classes, then it's very difficult for us to have enough money to be able to retire comfortably. That having the money inside of a savings account where we're receiving less than 1% is not going to work for us. Where I can show you a chart and you can see that they show the impact of inflation where $100 invested in 1913 would be worth less than $5 today because of inflation. That you would actually need about $3,200 to be able to afford the same amount of purchasing power as someone who had $100 in 1913. But then the opposite is true, we're invested in other assets. So for example, right, I'm not telling you to invest in gold, but the idea of gold is if I took an ounce of gold and put it in a safe in 1913, and then I opened it today, that pound of gold would be worth a lot more than $100 today. And so there are certain assets that do well, that we will be able to ride that wave and enjoy the benefits, and there are certain assets that don't which means we normally need to put our money in a smart place that naturally protects us because we're not trying to take heavy risks, but also at least protects us from inflation too so that we can appreciate and still have enough money to maintain our exact lifestyle that we currently have today. Our fifth and final bad financial habit that could derail your retirement is not even considering our healthcare costs. The numbers show, I think Fidelity did a study and it showed that on average, it's about $160,000, $70,000 is what you can expect to spend on healthcare over the life of your retirement as a single individual. Now, if you're a married couple, we would just double that where you can expect to spend somewhere around $350,000 to $400,000 as a married couple on retirement. We also see the numbers that show seven out of 10 people, 65 and older, will have at least one long-term care episode. Now, the numbers show that long-term care is about fifty dollars to $60,000 a year, and on average, it lasts three years. Not three years all in one lump sum, but it could be a year here, a year there, a year there. If we're just assuming that we're going to be healthy throughout our entire retirement, while I like the idea, I love the positive thinking, I do think it's important to be prepared that if something does happen, and maybe it's not us, but maybe it's our spouse, that we have a plan in place, that we have a certain percentage of our money in retirement that's allocated towards our healthcare expenses and the cost of that going up, because healthcare generally outpaces inflation. That if inflation is 3%, your healthcare expenses could go up 5 6%. And so if we are not considering long-term care or just general healthcare, then it really could leave a huge hole in our overall retirement plan. And a lot of people, the thought is, well, I don't have to worry about long-term care. I know that I'll have Medicare. Well, Medicare doesn't cover long-term care. And then you'll say, okay, well, I'll use Medicaid. Well, Medicaid is pretty restrictive on who they give long-term care coverage to. And I'll put a link to a video where I do discuss some strategies for someone who does want to plan on Medicaid but we're talking about not having much assets in your name, not having a lot of cash in your name. And then depending on where your retirement income is coming from, I mean, it's really a 10 year process. If you were to ask me if that was your overall plan. So we need to be considering how are we going to fund our health care? Are we going to have any of the supplemental plans? Or are we going to take Medicare Advantage? And I'll put a link to a couple of videos where I go into detail to help you decide which type of Medicare plan makes the most sense for you. But we do need to be thinking about this. 
everything from our traveling to our health and our doctor, all of these things need to be taken into consideration when we're estimating how much a doctor visit is going to cost us, how often are we going to go, are we going to pay deductibles and co-insurance, is it going to be a high deductible, low deductible, are we going to plan on going in-network, or are we going to be overseas and need to figure out whether or not we have coverage over there? There's a lot that goes into a healthcare plan, and the cost of it makes it something that we want to get right the first time. Because not having a proper healthcare plan in place by itself is easily something that could ruin someone's retirement. So we want to get ahead of that and put a plan in place. Then we can focus on the preventative stuff where we go walking 15 minutes a day, where we eat more fruits and vegetables, where we allow ourselves to kind of remove the stress in our life so that way we can feel better. There are lots of preventative steps we can take, but we also need to be considering the financial aspect of it as well. And so you can see that when it really comes down to making proper financial decisions, it really comes down to having proper financial beliefs that the relationship that we have with money is going to impact how we decide to spend it. And we all make decisions based on the beliefs that we have. And so we have to first take a step back and say, what was someone making the decisions that I'm making have to believe to make these decisions? And then we have to ask ourselves, are these beliefs helping me or hurting me? You can already see that whether we're talking about overspending to buy happiness, procrastinating on savings, carrying debt, avoiding investments, or just ignoring our overall health care, that any one of these can derail our retirement dreams. If you have any questions for me, go ahead and leave them in the comments. If I can be of any help to you as well, I'm always here. If you found value in this video, I simply ask for you to like and subscribe so you can continue receiving valuable insights on how to create your own wealthy retirement system. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy life.